My name is Arsenio James Advencula. I was born on January 25th, 1938 in Juneau, Alaska. I began studying martial arts at the age of eight, 1946, right after the war. When I'm talking about the war, I'm talking about World War II. At that time, I was eight years old. Other kids, I was new. I moved to Anchorage, Alaska from Juneau, Alaska, right after the war. At that time, a lot of kids were picking on me because I was different. They didn't know what ethnic group I was. So they called me Ching Ching Chinaman, Dirty Jap, Klutz, Siwash. These are derogatory terms for some of the natives and everything else. So one day I had a brand new cap. My dad bought me a brand new cap and brand new jacket. Some kids took it away from me. I told my dad he went back because I knew where the kids lived, or one of the kids lived. He got my cap and jacket back. The next day, I had two Philippine scouts, friends of my father, who were close combat instructors for the Philippine scouts. They taught me combat judo and escrima. Escrima is the Philippine martial arts using the blade. And at the same time, they taught me how to use rifle and bayonet. My dad bought me an old Springfield rifle, training rifle from the United States Navy with an 18-inch bayonet. So I learned to learn at that age to use the rifle and bayonet, escrima, combat judo. Combat judo today would be dirty fighting. It would be the same thing what people call jujitsu and all this. The only thing is it was not a sport. Later on, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1957. I came to Okinawa in no, late November 1958. After about five days on Okinawa on my first liberty, I studied Ishindu Karate on December 1st, 1958 from Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei in the Hambu Dojo in Agina, Okinawa. Throughout the years, being in the Marine Corps, I would come back to Okinawa. I married my wife in 1961. I keep returning to Okinawa. I found out that Ishindu was a combination of Shorindu and Gojudu. So I was very interested in, in uh, the roots of it. So I dabbled with Shorindu, I dabbled with Gojudu during my time of 17 years on and off Okinawa. Being in the Marine Corps, naturally I'm traveling back and forth. So probably about six years to seven years on Okinawa during that span. In 1975, Shimabuku Tatsu died and I went to study with, uh, well, I dabbled again with Uichidu and then later on uh, Kotro or Ia Kotro Sensei in Yukon Kai. I started with him since 1975, and I've been continuing karate ever since. Uh, at the same time, since I learned martial arts from Philippine scouts, which was then called combat judo and that, I helped initiate the Marine Corps martial arts program. And in, uh, I was awarded the Black Belt Emeritus in the Marine Corps martial arts program by the United States Marine Corps. So I'm very proud of that. Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei had promoted me to 7th Don. Iha Kotro Sensei in Dukan Kai promoted me to 9th Don. And as I already said, the Marine Corps Martial Arts Program gave me a black belt emeritus. But in all cases, I like to tell people, I have 73 years in the martial arts. I have 61 years in Ishindu Karate. Who cares what rank I am? It means nothing. Nayanji Kaza! Recollections of some of my teachers, let's talk about my primary teacher, Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei. Many people ask me a question. They say, uh, what's the most important thing you learned from your teacher? The most important thing I learned from my teacher, he was explaining to me the Kempo Gokui, in other words, what we call the Kota Karate. Some people call it the Eight Poems of the Fist. But he was explaining something to me. He was talking about the Third Code, and he was talking about keeping a reserve, and he tells me a story about World War II. 
prior to 1940 or 1944 was when they had the first air raid. Well, at that time, Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei was helping build Kadena Air Base, and he had horses and carts. And then he tells me that American planes came and wiped out his little factory or his little, his little business there. And he said he had no reserve. And he said the most important thing is to always have a reserve to fall back on. From that time on, I started saving money and everything else. And that was it. He also said in the same thing when he was explaining the Kempo Gokui, he was talking about health and fitness. Tatsu Shimabuku was a Sumuchi. Sumuchi is a fortune teller. Sumuchi itself in the Okinawan language means book, but it's often talked about a fortune teller that uses the I Ching, Chinese almanacs, calendars, things like this. So Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei said the most important thing was health and wealth. Wealth, if you can't take care of yourself and your family, then you have nothing. So number one is, he told me, health, wealth, and health. Number one, I study karate basically for health. And in health, since I want to live a good long life, I want to make sure nobody mel thumps me. And that's where self-defense has to go with karate. So this is what I do. So I try and keep in as best shape for my age that I possibly can. In 1964, after he gave me that lesson, I quit smoking. That was when the uh, Surgeon General said that he thought smoking was bad for your health. Well, I saved that money. I'm, now I'm a millionaire. I'm joking on that, but it's the same thing. This is what we do, health and fitness. And that's the most important thing I learned from my teacher. And other teachers that I studied with. I studied with, uh, with uh, Iha Kotro Sensei in the Dukon Kai Kobudu. And he was the one that taught me, number one is perfection. In other words, everything that they do is perfection. They try and do it, repetition, repetition, over, over, over. So I always talk about the three R's, repetition, repetition, the three P's, practice, practice, practice. If you watch their group, they're very professional in what they do. And I highly respect that. One of my other teachers that I did not mention was in 1961, I returned to Okinawa. An Okinawan friend of mine said that he knew a person that had studied in China. His name was Kinjo Kana Sensei, and he lived in Hamada in Kin Village. And he taught me a style that was called Hindi Andi. And he is one that taught me to, not to telegraph. In other words, you punch or you kick wherever your foot is, wherever your hand is. And I've always believed in that. So I've incorporated that in anything I do. I do not telegraph. In other words, that's one of the things I learned from him. When I studied with uh, Shorinru, it was a person by the name of Nagamini Seijin. And uh, he always asked me to come back and come back. The problem is that some of the techniques he did, there was just too much wrist locks and everything. And I asked him, I said, are you teaching Aikido? And he said, shh. So I quit. I wasn't interested in Aikido. I was interested in Karate. Today now I see many of the Karate throwing in Aikido, what they call Tuite, Tegumi, whatever the heck it is. In the old days, when I say the old days, 60 years ago, I never saw any of that stuff. Of course, there's some of it. But that's one of the things I see today. People are modifying. They're, they're changing and everything. That's okay. All things in the universe change. That's another thing I learned from Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei. Being a Sumuchi, one that uses the I Ching, the Book of Changes, all things in the universe will change. And so let's go with that. That's the way it goes today. There's nothing wrong with change. In uh, Karate, number one is we learn to post. That's basic. Nothing wrong with that. That's good. That's very similar to the United States Marine Corps when we learn to learn offhand position, just like this. Nobody in real combat is going to fire an offhand position here unless I'm braced against the side of a building or something like this. But it's teaching us discipline. It's teaching us to fire in the worst possible position that we can. If I can fire from this, then I can fire from any other position. Well, that's the same thing. When we first learned traditional karate, we post. If we're going to do, 
we post high. If we're showing in rue, we post on the hip, or if some branches are showing in rue. So we have one place to then. So that's teaching us the basic. That's the same thing as if we're in rifle and learning to shoot the rifle in this position here. But as you see, this isn't really practical. It's good for beginners. So it teaches us the basic, gives us a foundation. So this is okay. So Okinawan Karate, as we understand it, is primary based on power based on gamaku. Gamaku is the waist, and then chinkuchi is locking the joints and everything like this. The bad thing about using something like gamaku is they norm normally associate it with using it with a whip. So I have to post, I have to get it ready to, s when I post at any post, telegraphs the move. So the thing is, Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei, when we talk about him and we look at old photos of him, we see him, he's just standing. He's just like this. When we see other masters, we see them posed. Even when they're not doing anything, they're going over like this. Some of them try to show off their knuckles and all this and all this. Number one is we're right here because this is exactly how it's going to work. Right. We have to be able to punch. And when I touch you, you have to move. The most important thing now is to move our target. Today we have people doped up, they're crazy, everything else. So when people say, well, I'm going to knock you out, I'm going to hurt you or something like this, there are people that aren't hurt. When we go over there, we've seen this. We've seen people stung with, what, tasers, pulling them out and all this other. So the most important thing, in my opinion, is if I hit you, I have to move you. That gives me time to run away, do something else, throw a bigger weapon, which is my kick in this. In other words, if you're attacking me, when we do basic karate, that's okay. Getting in the poses, doing the traditional stuff, that's outstanding. That's for demonstration purposes. But if you're learning self-defense, you have to be prepared right here and now. So as soon as you move or anything, I have to be able to defend myself. If my hand is here and you start to reach for me, you see what I mean? I have to be able to hit you. Number one is, you have the reach on me. The thing is, you move, I don't move. Because I touch you and you're out of my range and that's ready for my next technique. And that's the important thing. So I'm not going to be able to get the outstanding power because I haven't got it. But that's chinkuchi. I touch you, this doesn't give. If I go here and snap or anything like this, which a lot of people do, most people snap too damn soon. We have a snap, but it's a snap lock and then come back. Yeah. But most people snap too damn fast. When they're demonstrating, boom, wow, it looks good, right? But in reality, it has to be what? It has to be something that'll jar you. Yeah. And in many cases, in other words, if we hit you and we're hitting you with the top two knuckles and all this and we penetrate, we might break a rib or something like this. And yes, it might stop you, but most important, it's got to move you. So even if I'm touching you and you're moving back and you touch me, you see what I mean? Yeah. I'm getting very little of your blow and you're taking a lot. So this is what we're talking about, no telegraph. Today we have to tell the younger people because they don't know what a telegraph is, <laughs> what not to telegraph. But that's what telegraphing, telegraphing is, is moving. In many cases, we'll see somebody setting and then you'll see the shake what I say, the shake right. before the technique. Yeah. That, in my unbiased opinion, is a telegraph. Yes. If I see you move, if I see you, a blink is a move. <laughs> as soon as I see you move, then we, we pop you. Right. It's as simple as that. You see what I mean? Otherwise, it's too late. Since Ishinru is based on two styles, number one, Shorinru and Gojidu, Tatsu Shimabuku said he took from Naihanchi. He took that from Shorinru. And that's gamaku, gamaku, the waist. In other words, so we take this. So our emphasis is on gamaku. And of course with chinkuchi, because at the base, we lock and all this for one split second. And then he said he took sanchin. Sanchin, we know, is a hard, and it goes forward and back. If we look at naihanchi, it's like a broken line. And we're talking about the I Ching. And the broken line stands for what? Female. And Gamaku is going here. You see what I mean? And then now we go Sanshin. And Sanshin is going up. Both are one line. 
left and right, okay? Most branches of Shoanaru go right and left. Motobu goes both. It doesn't make any difference. Tatsu also studied from Motobu. So number one is maybe he got that from him, maybe he didn't. I have no idea. The thing is, we do Sanchin. Sanchin's a hard kata. So it's emphasized in Chinkuchi. Nahanchi, Gamaku, Sanchin, Chinkuchi. And now Tatsu said he took Nahanchi, Shorinu, Gojudu, he took Sanchin, and he made Ishindu. If we look at the Embusan, it becomes a, 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 a plus, just like here. And add, add sign, just like here, north, south, east, west, four directions. And then if we look at Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu is the kata he created. And Sun Tzu is, that is the embusen. So that's what he did. He took Nahanshi and Sanshin. Many of the other branches did the same thing. If we look at Shitoru and all this, they've all done that. Yeah. They've all mixed. So when people talk about a pure karate, what's the matter? Come on, they're all mixing. They're all doing it. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I took Oichidu. I found out that Gojidu originally had open hands. So I said, well, well let's see what the hell yeah. was. And so I studied a little bit of Oichidu, only to find out what's going on here. And that's what we do. We're learning. And there's nothing wrong with that because everything is mixed and matched. But natural, you want to be natural and you want to be able to be able to work from this natural position. One of the things I teach my students is, is if something happens, hey, 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 hey. Hey, you don't do that. And that's a Kamai. <laughs> so that way it Very gives you, you Yeah, <laughs> same, yeah. Reach you brings hands out like here, you bring it back. Yeah. You see? Most people that see this, I used to reach you do this, you do there. He's just an American, just I don't want no trouble. But your hand are in position and all this, you see what I mean? And one of the things you want to do, okay? I like to front in the most in other words, I want to be in the most vulnerable position. If I, can, if I can do it, just like the rifle, if I can do this from the most vulnerable position, that's the way I train. I want to be right at this position. Right. In other words, whenever you make the move or anything like this, just, yeah. that's where I want to go. And then in that case there, it's from Basai. Yeah. Same thing. In other words, even though I don't hit you, it's blocking the arm and he still moves. You see what I mean? That, because that's Shinkuchi. Yes. If I go here, nothing. So the idea is to yep. move you so even if you hit me, at least you're going back when you're hitting me. You yep. see what I mean? So that's just basic. And then that's a classic punch in Ishindu. And then Basai does this, right. Ishindu we do this. <laughs> so when I do this, it's yep. the same. Yep. It's, it's, it's one without the other, but it comes from Basai, I'm just telling you. Yep. This is where everybody got confused about Ishindu Karate. They say, well, Tatsu doesn't do Goju Shiho. He doesn't do Pasai, Ananku. What they don't understand is Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu is his kata. In him, one of the techniques is here. You can now recognize, you can recognize all this. You can recognize all the different steps. Even our pad, you can see exactly where it comes from. Look at Sun Tzu, Tatsu, when he created Ishindu Karate, being a Sumuchi, he had to pick a lucky number. He wanted eight kata when he created his system. So he eliminated the ones he didn't like. And then when he made Sun Tzu, he took some things out of Basai, the U punch, and all this. And now we can see this. But many people say, well, if he learned those kata, why isn't he doing it? because he's a fortune teller, he's a samuchi. Eight is a lucky number. What happened when the Chinese had the Olympics? Eighth, 2008, eighth month, eighth, eighth day, eighth hour, eighth seconds. That's, and that's a communist country. They're good in tradition. You see what I mean into it? Well, this is it. Well, Okinawa, Tatsu is going to be a samuchi. There has to be an auspicious day. And that's what he did. If we look at it, January 1st would be the best day to name your style, correct? If you're going to name a style. The easiest to remember, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but he didn't. He picked January 15th. Because if we look at the Chinese almanac, if we look at it, that is a day that we can have what? A meeting and to start a new adventure. January 1st was no good. 
And that's why it was January 15th. He called the meeting and he created and he said, I'm going to name my system Ishindu. And that's the rest is history. After Shimabuku Tatsu died on May 30th, 1975, I started, I, as I already said, I started uh, fooling around with, or I started learning a little bit of uh, Uichidu. At the same time, my uh, brother-in-law, uh, Hiroshi Ikimiya, his best friend was Ia Kotro. So Hiroshi asked me, my brother-in-law asked me, he said, uh, you want to learn Kobudu? And I said, sure. And I said, where? He says, right here, right in Agina. Well, he was in Taba, which is right next to Agina. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll learn it. So ever since, I studied with uh, Ia Kotaro. At that time, we studied on the roof, rooftop dojo, as a matter of fact. Remember, we were out there, we used one street light. That's all they had, one street light. So it was in the dark when it rained. We'd have an umbrella sometimes, and I'd be teaching in there. And then in the daytime, he'd ask me to get into a Nekohashi or something. Then he'd look at it and he'd say, where the hell did you learn that? And uh, act, naturally, I'm learning in the dark <laughs> on the rooftop dojo and all that. Then he would correct me and all that. So we've been doing that for years. And later on, he now corrected it. And then he built a second story. And now he has an indoor dojo. And, uh, but that was how it was on the rooftop, rooftop dojo in the rain and everything else. And uh, we've been friends and, uh, ever since. And I visit him and we work with him. I bring my students. As a matter of fact, uh, most of my students have a chance to cross train and they get to train with uh, Ia Kotro Sensei. Talking about the past and Okinawan culture and everything like this, Again, one of the most important things I learned from Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei, there was an article in 1960 in Okinawan Times, and he said, in my heart, I wish that if karate becomes popular in the United States and Hawaii, that they would learn my culture. From that 1994, since 1994, I've been bringing people to Okinawa, and I call it the Okinawan Cultural Martial Arts Tour cultural first. I can always train in the States. As a matter of fact, my training is very hard in the United States. My pulse rate been down to 36 beats per minute resting, so I understand about being in outstanding shape. But culture is something that should be part of our, of our heritage. This is Okinawan Karate. In 2005, I was invited by the Okinawan government at the NPO symposium where they were talking about Okinawan culture and everything else. In it, one of the senseis said that one of his students had told him from Australia, he said, shouldn't culture be part of our training? And then I stood up and I said, my teacher said that in 1960. What took you so long? In other words, this is what I do. Okinawan karate, Okinawan karate without Okinawan culture is nothing. It's just words, and many people talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. So culture is the most important thing when you're studying Okinawan karate or kobudu. Okinawan culture, how do I like characterize it? Champaru, number one is. I get a kick. I just read recently somebody saying, we're getting away from Okinawan culture and we're going into Japanese culture. Idiot. Number one is, it's a multicultural thing now. Yes, we have the people that say we want to have 100% Okinawan culture. I'm sorry, it's Champaru. Whether you like it or not, Okinawa is a mixed culture. It's just like American culture is a mixed culture. That's where it's going to be no matter what. If we separate it and we say Okinawan culture, Japanese culture, American culture, then where's the Champaru? In other words, get along. That's the most important thing. Get along with each other. Quit fighting and bickering. I'm more Okinawan than you. I'm more Japanese than you. I'm more American than you. Come on, let's split it. Champaru. Matter of fact, here's a good story. Iakotro sensei, he comes, we're going to have a party. So he brings coffee and awamori because he likes to mix it. And then he brings sushi and then he brings Kentucky Fried. So one time we're sitting there and one of my students bought a gym, Jinbei. And then Iakotro sensei looks and he says, oh, Jinbei Japanese. 
And then I looked at him and I says, coffee American, awamori Okinawan, sushi Japanese, Kentucky Fry American. And then he laughed and he said, champaru. <laughs> True story. Sanshin kata. My uh, time in the Marine Corps, my profession, professional uh, career. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1957 at uh, Camp Pelt. Well, in, I was in Anchorage, Alaska. Then I went to, uh, uh, had boot camp in San Diego. Uh, as a matter of fact, in San Diego was the first time I ever got sunburn in my life because number one is I got there, I thought it was the hottest place in the world where that's where boot camp was. My ears were blistered and every everybody laughed at me and everything else. Since I was from Alaska, they gave me the nickname Eskimo and that was okay. So for the first three, or year, three years in the Marine Corps, I was known as Eskimo. Most people don't even know that. This is the first time they're hearing that. So I stayed in the Marine Corps up to three years. I had a tour on Okinawa. I came back to the United States. I got out of the Marine Corps. Then later on, I kept getting letters because there was conflict somewhere in the, in the world somewhere. And I said, that's not too bad. Marine Corps wasn't that bad. So I re-enlisted, but I re-enlisted for Okinawa. So they sent me right back to Okinawa and that was good. So I got to stay on Okinawa. Uh, later on, I had a, had a tour on uh, Vietnam, like most Marines. Then I had another tour on uh, Okinawa that was interrupted because I injured my back. So I was medevaced to Kui Hospital on Okinawa. Couldn't get any better than that. So now I'm on Okinawa again. So I get to train, uh, even with a body brace, I was training on Okinawa. Later on, I returned back to the United States. And then later on, I have another tour on, o on Okinawa. So on and off throughout the years, I've been returning to Okinawa, studying different martial arts, as I have already said, and everything else. I married my wife in 1961, and uh, she's Okinawan, and that's another reason we come back to Okinawa every year. But in the Marine Corps, we would be, I was a drill instructor in 1973, 74, 75. I was a drill instructor at Paris Island, South Carolina. At that place, or at, 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 at Paris Island, we would uh, do rifle and bayonet training and all that, teaching the recruits. And I didn't like the way they were being taught rifle and bayonet training. So later on, when I got out of the Marine Corps in 1981, I retired. I started teaching Marines. Many of the units at Camp Pendleton would send for me to teach martial arts. So I would teach rifle and bayonet, the combat judo I learned, mixed with karate and everything else. In 1986, there was a colonel in charge of 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, Colonel Jones, and he actually paid me to teach his troops. This person, Colonel Jones, later would be Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, and then he initiated the Marine Corps martial arts program. And they used Asian martial arts. One of the reasons they used Asian martial arts was because there was courtesy. It was not only punching, striking, kicking, and all this, it showed courtesy. 
There's an article in USA Today. I'm not sure what date it is, but in it, Colonel jo or at that time, the Commandant of the Marine Corps said, because when I tried to incorporate martial arts, create a Marine Corps martial arts program, and I went to all the different units at Camp Pendleton, the argument was if we teach them karate, they will have more bar fights and everything else. So we don't want to. That was it. But the Commandant of Marine Corps said in that article in USA Today, it was the direct opposite. Bar fights stopped and everything else because one of the things that they were teaching was not only punching, striking, and kicking, but they were also teaching courtesy. And as we know today, karate begins with courtesy and ends with courtesy. Uh, talking about Okinawan culture and martial arts teaching that Peace is the first thing. In Ishindu Karate, we our symbol shows, as you can see here, the soft, the hard. The softest is to talk your way out of trouble. The hardest is to use it. Everything is soft and hard in everything you had. When I first learned martial arts, remember, it was from Philippine scouts that were from the Philippine Army right after World War II. Their philosophy was kill, kill, kill. As a matter of fact, my when I was being beat up, my father bought me a fish knife. They still make them today. It's a little S-shape, had a yellow handle. And this is his exact words. He said, more than one gringo jump you, you cut off their throats. It's as simple as that. That's how I learned martial arts. It was not a sport. It was not a game. There was no peace. It was war. It's as simple as that. I joined the Marine Corps. We're not there. We're, first thing is peace first. We're the last people that want to go to war. But we're going to have to train people to go to war. So you have to get them to learn how to fight. But I'm just telling you, first, and being a Marine and a drill instructor, I understand what it means to get our troops into, into uh, the, 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 the mindset that they have to kill. So number one is boot camp is where we start. So at, that, at, at the time we were teaching, it was during the Vietnam era, it was about 11, 11 weeks. When I went through boot camp, it was like 14 weeks. So they cut it down because they had to have people going over to, to, the, to war. So you teach them, number, one of the things that they were teaching was hate. Sorry, that's the way it went. Because if you're fighting somebody that is a human, it's not the same thing. So we dehumanize the enemy. And that's exactly what happens. That's the same thing that happened in World War I, World War II, and everything else. You demonize the enemy, and he's no longer a human being. And that's the way. And this is what our mindset is. So it's kill, kill, kill. Close with the enemy and everything else. And that's what we did. But then when I came and I started really, when I first learned, I didn't really learn, how, or I didn't really have to come to Okinawa to learn karate to learn to fight. I think I already knew how to fight before I even joined the Marine Corps. But after I started learning karate and I started learning the symbol, started learning the symbol of peace first, then I started changing my attitude. As a matter of fact, I understand that in Kusanku, in Kusanku, the opening move of Kusanku is world peace. I know many Americans and foreigners have created combat moves for it. Number one is, it's world peace. We don't have to fight. Every, we don't have to learn combat moves for this movement. Because number one, it stands for world peace. And that's what we're talking, that's the first thing in Okinawan Karate that we learn in Kusanku. If we go to Gojudo, we have the Kempo Gokui. And it says a person's heart is the same as heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is the universe. It's the world. And we are one with the universe. If we're one with the universe, then we don't have to fight or anything else. This is what I learned about Okinawan Karate. But let's face it, there's yin and yang. There's both. There's the soft, there's the hard. So we have to live together with this. So number one is we work, we train, we want peace. But should war come, should it? somebody attack us in self-defense, then we have to defend ourselves. So if you're just going through kata, if you're going through something without bunkai, without application, if you don't know what it's for, then you're just going through a dance and that's it and nothing more.
Today now we've changed that. We've now made the kata no longer combat efficient, but for show efficiency, how it looks. We now extend the, ah! the key eyes. We now make the mean face and all this other good stuff. We're going into the Olympics. There's nothing wrong with this. Just understand, one is more show, one is combat, one is the culture. And this is what we have to understand. Nothing wrong with sport. Sport is okay. I never learned sport. I never thought war was sport. I never thought five kids jumping or six kids jumping on me was sport. I wanted to kick butt. I wanted to take care of my body. I wanted to make sure nobody male thumped me. And to this day, I train for combat. I do not, in other words, when I say combat, I'm talking about keeping somebody off me. I don't want to be hurt. Especially at my age, I don't give a damn. Like I said, you want a part of me, you get a part of me, and you'll remember me. But that's the way it's going to go. And when we do this, we have to put our heart, soul, and spirit into it. That's what we do. As a matter of fact, ishin, ishin, wholehearted, put your mind, body, spirit, everything into whatever heck you do. And this is the one beautiful thing about karate when we teach kids. If nothing else, the most feared thing for most grown-ups is what? to get in front of their peers. And when we teach children, what do they do? They're not afraid to get in front of anybody. They go out there and they all show off or they come out there, they want to do this. And that's the ideal thing about karate. And Okinawan karate, one of the good things, especially old Okinawan karate is still teaching tradition, the culture, everything else. Of course we can learn, we can go to the sport way, we can go to the show way, because show is that, that's part of it. When we demonstrate we're doing show, there's nothing wrong with show as long as you know it's show karate. There's nothing wrong with sport karate as long as you know it's sport. The young ones want the sport. In 2005, they said, of course we have to have the sport. The lead the young ones, they wanna do that. They wanna burn it out. But later on, what do we do? We lead them to kata. We lead them toward the other training. We treat that it's, first thing we understand is karate do. It's a way of life. I've been doing this for what? Since 19, 1946, and I'm still training? I think I've got it. I think I got it down right. That's what I think. Karate do, the way of life. My relationship with Okinawa from 1958, December, December 1st, 1958 to now. When I first came to Okinawa, there was a lot of thatch roof homes and houses and everything else. There was a lot of outhouses. If people had running water, it was just cold water. And there were still wells on Okinawa. And uh, things have changed tremendously in that time. When I was in Agina, about two, two, two city blocks were paved. The rest was dirt and everything else. So you, we can see exactly how things are going here. There was all mom and pop stores and everything else. When we go on the road and everything else, there were all wooden wooden buildings, sliding doors, and now we can see how it's changed completely. When I tell people how it was at that time, most people have no idea, they don't believe it, or anything else because it's all everything is paved, everything is concrete and all that. When I was on Okinawa, I worked for, uh, when I was at Camp S.D. Butler, that was my first duty station, which was at McTourist or Kawasaki, if you want to know the Okinawan village. And at that time, I worked for emergency maintenance. So whenever there was a typhoon, while everybody else was inside the barracks and that, I was out there going over there and latching down buildings and uh, keeping things from flying around and all that other good stuff. Today, now, we have concrete buildings. We don't have to worry about latching down. We don't have to put cables. The butler buildings aren't blowing away and all this other, well, they might still be blowing away because you, I still see a few out there. And the Quonset huts were, were, were tied down and all this. Everything has changed completely. At that time, there was buses. Buses were everywhere. Very few cars. Today now, we can't get anywhere. It's all cars. Everything is modern. Everything is, at that time when we caught a bus, you paid in, in, in uh, yen and it would cost you maybe 10 yen to go uh, from one town to another. I don't know what it costs today, but I'm just saying everything is, is completely changed. The, uh, if you wanted to find a restroom, it was very hard. If you wanted to find a dojo, you walked down the alleys and you'd hear a makiwara or you'd hear a kiai. 
and then you can inquire. There was no signs or anything like this, except for a few of the professional dojos. The Marine Corps was paying Shimabuku Tatsu Sensei. He had a contract. Uichi also had a contract, and other, other, other dojos had contracts and that. So you would see a big sign, you know, so it was special services was paying for this. And I understand the Army also was teaching certain teachers and all this, and the Air Force was teaching different people like this. Today now, you can go special services. I don't know today. I, I, I kind of believe that the Marine Corps is still doing it. The other branches are doing still special services. So if you want to study karate and that, you can do it on the base. But uh, I, if you have a chance, I tell everybody, go into the town, go into in, in, and go with the people. I have people bragging that they spent 10, 15 years on Okinawa, and yet they know nothing about the culture. They never went to Shimimai. They never went to anything. They never done anything. They never burned incense in a home. Uh, how, how they're missing something like this is, is unbelievable. But again, you have to get into the Okinawan culture, not, not stay on the base and everything else and say, oh, I've been here all this time, and yet you don't even know what's going on in the bill. And uh, Asa, and see the dancing and the friendship and all this. That's Okinawa, going into and seeing the culture and seeing the Asa and uh, Oban and understanding. I remember one, one guy that had been here for about eight years. He said, oh, I see the fireworks. Sorry, that's not Okinawa. So this is it. So this is what I say if you're in Okinawa, then participate in Okinawan culture. Find it. It's all over the place. Ikigai, Japanese term for a reason for living, a reason for getting up in the morning. This is my Ikigai. I have a dojo. I have a garden dojo on, in California, Sandy, or in Oceanside, California. The first thing I did was when I came back, I got out of the Marine Corps. I said, I'm going to build a dojo in my backyard. So I went in my backyard. I paced off how I'm going to build the building and all this. And then I sit, checked. And this is, we're talking back there in 1981. And I looked, or 19, it was actually 79 when I built, or 78. And I come over there and I say, it's going to cost me forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And I says, wait a minute. When I first went to Okinawa, when I first went to Okinawa, the dojos were outdoor. The dojo I went to under Shimabuku Tatsu was just a concrete slab. So what I did was I poured a concrete slab and I says, wait a minute. I'm in Southern California. I'm in San Diego. What the heck? I can have an outdoor dojo just like I studied on Okinawa, and this is what I got. So I train two methods. It's a garden dojo. So I have a garden. I have a supervisor, Michi, my wife, okay? So I work in the garden almost every day, and I have my dojo whenever I want to. I hit the makiwara. I can do anything I want to do. I do a kata, whatever. So this is what I do every day. Every day I'm doing something in the garden, my garden dojo. I'm doing either gardening or I'm doing martial arts in there. And that's what I do today. It's a reason for getting up. It's a reason for me to train. I bring people to Okinawa to serve the, cust the customs. That's my ikigai. I love it. I do seminars. I go and I do what I want to. People say you're doing it for money. So what's wrong with that? That's your icky guy. Somebody said, I said, number one, this is my hobby. They said, it can't be. Karate is not your hobby. Idiots. Number one is, it's everything. It's my hobby. It's my livelihood. It's my way of life. I get up. I do it. I hit the makiwara, whether I get paid or not. People are sending me for seminars. I get to go, and they pay me, and I hit them, and they love it, and they show their bruises. This is happening all the time. What else better life can you have? Find out what you love to do. Make it your job and you'll never go to work another day in your life. I've never had to work. This is what I've done my whole life. I picked it. I don't make a lot of money, but I sure enjoy what the hell I do. And this is exactly what I do. 
In other words, this is my icky guy. It is my hobby. For all those that say it is not a hobby, you are wrong. It's a way of life. If I can make a dollar doing what I love to do, what is your problem? That's what they exactly what they tell you to do when you retire. Take your life. Find out what you do well. Make it your job. If you can make extra money, do it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no sin in making money. This is what I do. This is my icky guy. This is my life's blood. And being married to an Okinawan gives me an excuse, an excuse to come back to Okinawa every, day, every year, sometimes twice. Sometimes I go to the special events. This is it. This is my icky guy, my reason for living. Number one is my wife, family first. Since my family's from Okinawa, I have a chance to go to Okinawa whenever I want to. And I say, dear, you want to go back to Okinawa? Yes, there we go. And then again, most important for loving words is, Jim, start working in the garden. And then that puts me in shape. Say, icky guy. <laughs> <laughs>